All right, so yes, welcome back uh, for day two. Uh, much appreciated, everyone who made it out for 9 a.m. in the wet and the Belgian. Um, gray, dark. Stop, stop. Sorry, stop. sorry, sorry. I know I'm making us look bad on the internet. Sorry, sorry. Everything here is great, and you should all, everyone online, uh, you should come visit. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, without further, without further, uh, without further delay, our uh, our first talk for today is our uh, our dear friend and colleague uh, Quentin Fouillon, who's uh, now at the Université de Madrid, but is a uh, let's just say a known quantity around these parts, dear 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 friend, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, entity realism, which uh, uh, a bit well. A bit appropriate given uh, given given hacking's passing, I yes. suppose we could have a, a bit of a memorial oh, yes. lecture. Um, so, without further ado, please. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, my talk is about uh, core tenets of scientific realism. So one of the coordinates of realism is that the entities postulated by scientific theories, by scientists, really exist. And what, what I hope is to convey the idea that this idea of really existing, which is often cast in terms of mind independence, is not that trivial and yeah, and it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, the sense entertained by a scientific realist is not necessarily the one, uh, the common sense meaning of uh, existing or, or, or of reality. And uh, I will do this by defending a position which is known as entity realism. So you've probably heard of uh, entity realism. It's uh, a <coughs> position that was uh, proposed in diff slightly different way by Nancy Cartwright and by Jan Hacking, who, who just died a few days ago. So I hope I, I will uh, do justice to his, <laughs> to his view. Uh, and well, these two philosophers are, are held responsible for mainly for what is sometimes called a practical turn in philosophy of science. So focusing more on scientific practice instead of abstract theories and abstract frameworks for thinking about science. Uh, what they have in common in particular is that they are a bit suspicious about the kind of explanatory inference that, that uh, scientific realists uh, often put forth. Uh, and one, one way to defend this, uh, this suspicion, this idea, is to observe that well, realists often put emphasis on the on scientific progress. Say, oh, scientific science is so successful, so we have to be realists somehow. But if you if you think about what kind of progress science uh, is impressive in science, well, uh, you could say that the the most obvious, the the most impressive progress is a kind of technical progress. Uh, scientific development gives us uh, uh, planes, uh, various technologies, computers, and, and so on. And but the theoretical progress is not is not as obvious. Let's say that the the practical progress offered by science. So what this philosopher uh, have in mind, well, uh, I think, is that we should focus uh, when doing inference. We should put emphasis on. Inference is not from abstract theories to reality, but rather from practice, from the success of scientific practice, in order to make inference, metaphysical inference, inference towards what reality is like. And this goes with the general suspicions but against uh, inference to the best explanation. So, as you probably know, mo the, the debate on scientific realism really turns around uh, whether inference to the best explanation. Well, uh, non realists can agree that. Scientists use a kind of abduction, but generally what they would say is that uh, the term abduction was introduced by uh, Charles Peirce, and what Peirce had in, had in mind is that abduction is a kind of heuristic process 
by which scientists uh, find hypotheses and then they put their hypothesis to, to test, to empirical <coughs> test, they confront uh, the various hypotheses that they, that they <coughs> Uh, come to with uh, through abduction, but the, what really matters for justification is empirical tests, basically. And so this this kind of idea is against the real view that abduction per se is some kind of uh, justification that an explanation is justified only by, because it is a good explanation. And this this is a kind of uh, inference that. Uh, Non-realist will resist, and anti-realist as well. So you have a chapter in uh, Nancy Cartwright's book on uh, how uh, the laws of uh, physics lie. You have a, a chapter dedicated to a criticism of abduction, of inference to the best explanation. So the idea <coughs> that basically is that well, if you look at practice, we can be realist about the kind of thing that we interacted with directly. If we have causal relations with so uh, Jan Hacking, for example, uh, was taking the example of electrons. He said, I went to in the laboratory, I saw, I saw that uh, the scientists say, oh, beware, we are, we are projecting electrons there, don't uh, go this way. <laughs> and say, OK, if we are projecting electrons, if we are using electrons to do something, then electron exists, surely. And it sounds like common sense. So they, they want to go back to common sense uh, in, in some sense. And according to them, according to Cartwright in particular, theories are mere guides for successful uh, practice, empirical practice. We shouldn't take theories too seriously, in particular because of the, uh, the traditional arguments against realism that theories change with time, and so you know, the pessimistic uh, meta-induction. So entity realism is often uh, dismissed in the literature my impression is that uh, a lot of people that, who talk about the debate on scientific realism say, oh, you know, you have these various options, but uh, entity realism is just, uh, well, yeah, it has been proposed, but it's not serious. It doesn't wor really work. And here is uh, a caricature. It's, it, it was, uh, it, it's not really an argument that was <laughs> put against <coughs> entity realism. It's a caricature by someone who wants to defend uh, realism. Which is uh, uh, Musgrave, and uh, it's cited by uh, an, by Clark, who also defends uh, entity realism. So Musgrave say, uh, "I tell you that I believe in hobgoblins." So you reply, "Oh, you think there are little people who creep <coughs> into houses at night and do the housework?" Oh no, uh, say I. I do not believe that hobgoblins do that. Actually, I have no beliefs at all about hobgoblins about what go how goblins do or what they're like, I just believe in them. <laughs> so, yeah, this is silly. Uh, and, but it's not what entity realists say. Uh, but <coughs> it's often like the, the dismissal that you find in the literature is a bit like if that's what, that's what they were saying. But it's, it's, not, it's not really what they're saying. So, but the idea, the, the main criticism is that <coughs> theories would be indispensable. We cannot believe in entities if we don't believe in the theories that describe this, these entities. <coughs> you have many articles, uh, uh, mostly published in the 90s or uh, beginning of uh, uh, 2000, uh, that's in this line of criticism. But here I want to defend <coughs> a bit more anti-terrorism by taking like a larger view at what, what uh, in particular Nancy Cartwright's philosophy of science <coughs> is. So uh, Cartwright, uh, as I say, can be credited for, for uh, uh, putting forth uh, the practical term. And a way of putting this idea is that she's promoting a pragmatic view of scientific theories. So, Maybe you know that there, are, there have been some switches in how we understand scientific theories, we philosophers understand scientific theories. The classical view uh, in the first half of 20th century was the syntactic view, that theories are statements. Basically, there are laws expressing uh, theoretical vocabularies, they express laws of nature or theoretical laws. And then people started saying, well, theories, yeah, they are important, but they are nothing without models. The important unit 
uh, for scientists to represent reality are models. This is what scientists, scientists use. And this is called the semantic view. This is the idea that scientific theories are families of models, families of theoretical structures that can be used to represent the world. And then come the, the pragmatic term who say, yeah, well, sure, theory models are important, but models are nothing without their users and the context in which they are used. Uh, users put a lot of things into models that do not come from the theory and not come, they do not either come directly from the situation to which the model is applied. There are, these are ad hoc postulates that scientists made. For example, there, there are articles about supraconduction, uh, the history of supra, models of supraconduction, where we can see that, well, what scientists do is that they make domain-specific postulate, and they put this into their models. And they also put in idealizations. They distort the laws of the theory in order to build their model. And all this is sensitive to the context, to the, uh, the kind of application that they, they have uh, in view. So if we accept this pragmatic view, then a way of uh, fleshing out anti-terrorism that I find personally convincing is basically anti-terrorism is realism about applied models and it's instrumentalism about scientific theories. So when you successfully apply a model with all the things that scientists put in the model and when it's successful for practical purposes or for explanatory purposes maybe, we will come to this later, then uh, you can be realist about this model. And what this, what applied model, uh, what the structure of applied model in general is something like a causal structure of entities. So it's, in general, scientific model can easily be interpreted as a kind of causal structure of entities we, with which we can interact. And so basically this is the idea. So Sterical laws are tools that we can use to build models. We will we postulate causal structures. We we test the model, and when they are efficient, when we are they are a good empirical uh, stability, then we can be confident that we can be realist about what the model says. The, there are these causal structures and these entities, and they exist. But now here come uh, this is a kind of view that. Uh, a bit of self-promotion, uh, a kind of view that is very close to what I defended in a book that I published uh, two years ago, which is called Model Empiricism. Uh, except for a caveat that I'm uh, coming to now, which is, uh, what do we mean by exist? And this is precisely the topic of my talk. What, what do we mean when you say these entities exist? Uh, and is it true that everything that we can manipulate exists? And in what sense of exist? And here the main problem, I think, for entity realists is that uh, it's not clear that they can get to the kind of existence that metaphysicists are after, which is generally, as I said at the start of my talk, in terms of mind independence. Mm -hmm. So just to take an example, money. Does money exist in a mind-independent sense? Well, it's not obviously the case that money exists because it depends on our trusting uh, uh, the, the money, the, that we can buy things, that we can uh, uh, exchange it, and so on. Uh, just to say a bit more about mind independence, uh, the term is a bit misleading somehow because uh, you have some things that some entities that we would say that are mind dependent in one sense but that are not mind independent in the sense that the realists want for example mental states beliefs desires mental diseases these are kinds of entities that are mind dependent because they are about the mind they, they wouldn't exist without the mind uh, but they do not depend for their existence on the way we represent them. 
And that's the main point that the metaphysicists want to put for that. The way we represent these entities is we represent it accurately, but it exists in this way, in the way we represent it, independently of the fact that we represent it in this way. So maybe it, should, it would be more accurate to say representation independent, something like that. Concept independence, independently of our concept of it, or something like that. And then another important point is what kind of dependence and metaphysicists, uh, what they want is not necessarily causal independence because we can interact causally with um, things that are considered natural kinds. We can, for example, we can create diamonds. Uh, but diamond is supposed to be a natural kind, it's a chemical kind. Uh, but it's created by us, so it wouldn't exist without us. Uh, and on the other hand, if you take constellations, they are clearly not real for uh, in a metaphysical sense. Constellations are just arbitrary grouping of stars, but we do not causally interact with the stars that are referred to, the group of stars that is uh, referred to by the constellation. So it's not causal dependence that matters, but uh, constitutive independence. And just to be more precise about what we're after, I think that the main criteria that we can use is externalism about uh, meaning. I think that's, that's where it, what it boils down to in the end. So the idea is that of, of uh, independence from the mind, that these entities have some kind of essence that does not depend on the way we represent this essence. And so there is this idea that there is some kind of necessity, some kind of explanation for the similarities in the causal patterns that we observe. Uh, for example, there are causal patterns associated with water, and we can explain these causal patterns because all water stuff has a common nature. So this, this is the idea. And this is associated, there is a strong association between this and, of course, the Kripkean uh, semantics and the externalism about uh, meaning. The idea that we can point to water without knowing its constitution, its nature, but we postulate that all this stuff that behaves in a similar way has a common uh, nature, a common mm -hmm. constitution. And so I, I, will, I will use this criteria for uh, mind independence, which is externalism, which can be expressed in this way. We could be wrong about uh, the cr criteria for belonging to a category. If we could be wrong, if we can point to a category, but in principle, we could be wrong about its nature. If its nature is discovered a posteriori, then this category can be considered mind independent in the sense that is relevant for uh, for the realist, for the metaphysics, for metaphysics. And then the problem, we, we come to the problem for entity realism, is that all the things that we can manipulate are not necessarily mind independent in this sense. So for example, a trivial example, uh, chairs. We can manipulate chairs. We can make inferences about chairs. They are kind of projectable. We can assume that in general they will have uh, certain features. We, there are patterns associated with chairs and with artifacts in general. So a hammer, for example, you can make inferences about a hammer, what a hammer uh, is able to do or not, in terms of being a hammer. But if you look at the accounts of artifacts in the philosophical literature, what you find is that, uh, in general, people are drawn to say that the essence of artifacts is mind-dependent. It depends, in particular, in the, on the intentions of creators. Uh, why this is so? Because uh, you, could, you, could say, you could say, well, uh, a tool it can just be reduced to, it's a functional kind. You could have this idea. A hammer is something that can uh, do a s such thing as a I, I don't know, uh, hitting, uh, well, everything you could do with a hammer. 
The problem is that there are these functioning hammers, but they're still hammers. So it doesn't work very well to say, well, uh, hammers just a kind of function, something that realizes a kind of function, because there are these functional hammers. And also, you could attempt to reduce uh, chairs, for example, to some uh, necessary and sufficient features. But in general, it's the variety of chairs is too, is too important to really find some definite, uh, a, de a real definition of what a chair is. So what, what philosophers such as Thomas, uh, Thomason, for example, have proposed is that the essence what if we, if we go back to what we have to the explanation for the patterns uh, associated with chairs is that all the creators of chair have intentions that are rooted in the same norms about what a chair should be like so kind of, of comprehension of, uh, by uh, manufacturers of chairs that what chairs are supposed to do and this <coughs> is the essence of chess, but it's a mind dependent essence because it depends on the intentions of creators. So, all this to say basically that uh, there is a we have a problem for entity realism, which is that the kind of causal inferences that they want to use for to, to assume that something exists, something is real, well, it would also make us assume that chairs or uh, artifacts are real and, they, and that they exist but they do not they are not real and they do not exist in the sense that the metaphysicists want because they are not mind independent uh, okay so now maybe if I ask are electrons artifacts of experimental practice where uh, maybe not. It's not very intuitive to say that electrons are artifacts of our experimental practices, but uh, a non-realist could, could uh, bite the bullet, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, the main point that I want to make is whether you agree or not that it's intuitive or not, it's that it's not ruled out by causal inference. So the entity realist, the entity realist wants to have like, a robust notion of existence, then more is needed than just the kind of causal inference that they put forth. That's the main uh, point that I want to make. Uh, now, maybe a way to save uh, entity realism is to say, OK, we should not limit ourselves to experimental practice. <coughs> maybe Jan Hacking put a lot of emphasis on, on, on the interaction, on uh, using electrons as tools uh, to, to making other uh, kind of uh, experiments and so on. But Cartwright a bit less so. And we could say, well, the important point is, what I say is realism about applied models. But models can be applied even if there is no interaction. We can have models of uh, remote stars, for example. And we can say, well, this model is very successful for at prediction. And so we can say that it represents correctly uh, the phenomena that we want to explain, even if there is no direct interaction. Uh, but I think that even taking this, uh, this line is not enough to, <coughs> to save the entity realism. Uh, and the main reason is that uh, if we do that, uh, in the end what we are saying is that electrons or, or whatever entity is just, they are the nodes in causal structures, in the causal structures, the causal patterns that we identify. They are the the, the, yeah, the points, uh, the nodes in these patterns. And, uh, and this amounts to, to have a functional kind, to say that electrons are functional kinds. They have a certain f causal function. And there are several very interesting articles that argue that uh, functional kinds and externalism do not work very well uh, together. There's this article by Weber, in particular, that is about genes. And what Weber says is that uh, the first notion of gene that scientists had is the kind of thing that obey Mendelian patterns. But then, with uh, scientific progress, with uh, more development, why well, it occurred that there are various notions of genes and not only one. Uh, you have the combinational unit, you have the 
uh, mutation units and they're not necessarily the same and then it was extended to bacteria and there were debates about whether the same term should be used or not and we could say well basically it was a pragmatic issue whether we should use gene for bacteria that don't have chromosomes and that don't have the Mendelian patterns that were used to identify genes in the first place. It's a pragmatic matter whether we use the same word or not. And Laporte has the same kind of argument. What he says is that externalism does not really work so well with scientific terms, actually. Uh, what happened is that meaning change when theory change, but it gets, generally it gets more precise. Uh, and you have a choice between various meanings. You could say the same about, the same about uh, mass, for example. Newtonian mass uh, in relativity it can be divided into various different, slightly different concepts of mass that, uh, that overlap sometimes, that are not exactly the same. And in the end, what Weber says is that when you have a functional kind, uh, such as the modern concept of gene as a, a protein, uh, a unit for protein produ production, well, in this case, uh, scientists know exactly what the definition is. And they cannot be wrong, because they define gene as the kind of thing that has this function. So it's not really uh, so externalism does not work and so well it seems that the kind you don't have the kind of mind independence that the metaphysicists would like to have uh, and in particular we could argue that electrons or genes or Newtonian forces for example are kind of epistemic artifacts uh, so they depend on the intention of the creator of the concept who wants to capture some pattern and define genes or, well, at least one conception of gene or Newtonian forces as what uh, realize such or such function. Uh, and the case of Newtonian forces, I think, is quite convincing because a lot of forces are taken to be artifacts of the of calculus. You, know, you have result, uh, resultant forces that physicists would say, well, they do not really exist, they're kind of... Uh, kind of uh, uh, an artifact of the calculus. So, and if you take Newtonian theory from the point of view of relativity theory, you could say that in the end, all uh, gravitational forces are these kind of artifacts for uh, models in flat space-time. Okay. Uh, so in the end, you have a dilemma for the entity realist, which is, that causal inferences do not track mind independence. And so they still need the argument that they don't like, which is the kind of meta-abduction uh, proposed by realists that uh, these entities best explain such phenomena. And so we can infer that they exist in a mind independent set. Well, if they want real mind independence, they should use some kind of meta-abduction. It's not even clear to me what role would play mind independence in, in the what explanatory role plays mind independence in their in this kind of arguments. But uh, in any case, I don't think that they can get to mind independence with uh, only with the kind of causal inference, even ap applying models, uh, being realized about models outside of uh, experimental uh, concrete experimental uh, practice. And on the other hand, well, money tables, uh, tools, all exist in a common sense of existence. Uh, you can ask uh, your neighbors or non-philosophers. <laughs> uh, all the non-philosophers, you know, they would say, yes, chairs exist, <laughs> money exists. Well, you have real money and you have fake money. If you cannot pay me with uh, the coins of your toy or I don't know, or, uh, this is fake money. If you can pay me with it, it's real money. Uh, but it's mind dependent. So, so I think that the point I want to make is that in this debate, there's kind of ambiguity and realism sometimes trade on this ambiguity. So uh, they want to be along with common sense, say, of course it exists. So uh, uh, in his talk, Anjan yesterday say, well, if you see something in the mic microscope, you can understand the frustration of the realist. Of course, I can see it, it exists. <laughs> yes, it exists, but uh, in the common sense, surely it exists. But does it exist as the metaphysicists would like it to exist in the mind-independent sense? 
as a category of nature uh, that is not uh, imposed by our explanatory project or stuff like that. And I think that <coughs> there is always this ambiguity, and at least the risk should be clear that uh, they should decide. If they want to side with common sense, they should take a more deflationary approach and say, well, existence uh, in a deflationary sense, in the common sense. Uh, mind independence doesn't matter. But if they want to say that, yes, they, it exists mind independently because it's our best science and so on, they shouldn't claim to be on the side of common sense or, or, the side, or even on the side of scientists because I, I believe that scientists use exist and real in the in a sense, in a common sense of real existence and not in the sense of philosophers. So, so they shouldn't claim that they are on the side of scientists and that the, the non-realists are on the side of uh, uh, defending counterintuitive views. Well, at least that I want to put this, uh, this deflationary stance. And so, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, I think we should embrace, my point of view, that we should embrace common sense existence and forget about mind independence. It's not clear that it plays a role in explanations. Uh, so an interesting point is that it's relative to the community. If you, can, you could imagine an uh, alien civilization uh, studying chairs and trying to find out the essence of chairs, and obviously it would, there, is, there would be a kind of externalism. They would say, what explains this pattern? We can refer to this object, the lookalike. And for them, it would be externalism because it depends on our intention as a, as a community. <coughs> but for us, it's not mind independence. So mind independence is relative. And so we could wonder if, it's really, if it really matters. Uh, there are, so there are artifacts that are mind dependent in the sense that this category of object is not, is not uh, depend on our intentions. But we can study it with physics. We can study the physical property of these kind of objects. And Diamond is supposed to be a natural kind, but we can study the social characteristic of diamonds if we want. So why impose this kind of distinction between social and natural stuff? I would say as a conclusion that uh, if a category is interesting and projectable, and I think that's, I think that's more or less an idea defended by uh, Anjan in this article, uh, Last Chance Summers for Natural Kind Reason, that if a category is interesting and projectable, then we can do science with it. And it doesn't matter if it's mind-dependent or not. Excellent. Okay. One, two, three, four. Yes. Thanks, Todd. Uh, great. Uh, I'm, I'm missing a link. Maybe it's just because I'm not familiar enough with uh, entity realism, but I'm missing the link between the uh, like accepting the existence of entities and uh, the accepting the existence of natural kinds. So is it like is it, is it just a common thing for entity realists uh, to do that they don't realize they do that they just go from like I mean well electrons exist in terms of like instances of electrons that we can actually manipulate and then they go from that to the the like the claim that electrons exist as a natural kind, or, or is it just a, a feature of your interpretation here? Because I, I didn't uh, get that from the talk. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, it might be a way that anti terrorists could uh, respond, maybe. Uh, <laughs> they would say, yes, electrons exist, but not as a natural kind. But then uh, what kind of object is it? Uh, it's not clear to me what, I mean, Saying that something exists, usually you have to classify it. No, you or at, or at least they need a, a very vague category. It exists as an object. And then the object must be some kind of natural mind independent kind. If, if we want mind independent existence, I think we have to say something like that. Mm. But yeah, but surely the mind independence of objects as a general category is much less uh, problematic than of particular kinds, right? That could be a line of defense, maybe. Okay. I, I should think about it, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Quentin. I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to where you end up. And I just had a, a question about that, because there's a sense in which uh, Cartwright and Hacking and some other entity realists sit kind of uneasily under the heading of scientific realism, because they're very hard to pin down on exactly the question that you mentioned, which is, you know, 
what sense are we even realists? And hacking in particular is kind of allergic to any kind of, you know, he calls them elevator words. I mean, like yeah. he's talking about mind independence or mm -hmm. these highfalutin philosophical concepts. Um, so he would want to use the words, you know, existence and real, I think, in exactly the way you propose, which is just on a par with other things. But if we go that route, then it sounds very much like, and this is really my question to you, uh, it sounds a lot like Arthur Fine and the natural mm -hmm. ontological attitude. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. So the idea is that, look, it, it really doesn't make sense, or there's no coherent way in which we can, we can really talk about uh, things being real in a way other than the common sense notion of things being real. And so anti realists and realists alike are guilty of doing what hacky doesn't want them to do, which is use these elevator words. They're guilty of pounding the table and saying, no, they really, really exist. Yeah. And I was saying, no, they don't really exist, they just really exist. <laughs> so, uh, but then it sounds like Arthur Fine was generally not considered a realist. Right? Yes. Precisely mm -hmm. because of so, so do you think that they're realists at the end of the day? Or do you think uh, they have a I think, ontological attitude? I think at the end it's a matter of a label what we want to call realism because my feeling is that a lot of people want to say, oh, I'm a realist because, precisely because it sounds like good sense, common sense to be a realist, and weird to be non-realist. And, but in the end, it's a matter of how we define realism. If we, we, st if we want to stick to the strict definition that is put forth by many realists in terms of mind independence, then this is not <coughs> a, realist, a, re a kind of realism. <coughs> but now, my impression is that a lot of people who are pragmatically oriented and uh, deflation in spirit, they want to say that they are realists. I don't know why, but they, <laughs> <laughs> they want to say, oh yeah, I'm realist. Uh, an example of this is uh, Putnam, who's, who's called his position internal realism. Yeah. So why is it, in what sense is it realism? I'm not sure, but it's, he wants it to be a kind of realism. So I think it's, yeah, it's a matter of uh, a label, how we want to call ourselves. Thank you for your talk, Quentin. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that on the point of uh, you know, charging against entity realism with criteria of my independence. I don't think that would be fair. Uh, they wanted to avoid this hidden physical uh, thesis of my independence and uh, take over manipulation, experimentation, and so forth. Uh, but on another thought, uh, would you say that common sense uh, perhaps could be a criterion for you know, having an idea about scientific realism, getting close? Uh, scientific realism and common sense. But in there, you have a very hard uh, job to specify what common sense is. Uh, yeah, what common sense is, and what's the relationship between common sense and scientific realism. Some people could go uh, eliminate beasts about views in common sense when they are theoretical. Some people will try to go for a conservative approach, saying that we are going to try to serve as much as possible from common sense when it comes to practical matters not theoretical ones. So what would be your uh, understanding or preliminary understanding of common sense? Uh, that's a vast question. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, culture, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's culture dependent. Uh, it's uh, culture dependent. For my mom, for example, well, I believe in God would be quite commonsensical, but I have serious doubt about warranty of that belief, and you know, it's culture dependent, context dependent, and yeah. Well, I tend to think, to think that we should be faithful to common sense in the sense that when we're using words as philosophers, uh, at some point we will have to express our views in, uh, to make popularizations. And yeah. it's, uh, and but if, but we, but if we express ourselves in terms that are really idiosyncratic, it's more a pragmatic matter. Yeah, I think it doesn't, it's not necessarily good for philosophy to use two technical terms that are too far yeah. apart for common sense. Yeah. I think to, to some extent, yes, common sense can be revised when it's not very coherent or yeah. when, when it's yeah. not the best way of, of understanding the world. It can, we can revise yeah. our concept, but uh, yeah, it's a complex question like, to which one we should uh, yeah, Stay close to be more yeah. straight, straightforward, I don't think there is anything like common sense. Uh, do you remember that, that passage at the beginning of the card? I mean, common usage of the world. He says, uh, common sense is the most well-distributed yeah. thing. Yeah. 
I mean, the way, the way words are used in general, that's what I would call common sense, the way people use words. So basically, we could, ex we could just make linguistic uh, studies to find out what people mean by existing. What people? Or, uh, that I'm, I'm in favor of the kind of uh, experimental philosophy approach for, for speci specifically for this kind of project, yeah. to find out what, what are the common sense view yeah. or the common usage of words. Uh, yeah. yeah, and don't get me wrong, I love what your presentation and your book too. Uh, but the common sense thing is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <enough. laughs> Okay, uh, many thanks for it, that was really great. Um, I mean, I, I'm following your argument on this certain point. Um, I can imagine that some metaphysician could say, okay, existence is complicated. Uh, probably if we have. Uh, to a strict definition of existence, many things are not going to exist, and you have this issue with the common sense. But probably many, many metaphysicians could say something like, okay, probably existence is not the important question. Probably we should be too liberal, um, quite liberal about existence. Every, everything can enter the ontology as an ontological free lunch. But now the, the question is about how different things exist, right? And we can start to distinguish between yeah. model of existence. So now we have something are fundamental, something are derivative, but okay, money exists, but it's not fundamental. Uh, common sense uh, uh, entities exist, but they are not fundamental. And they are, they are just, I mean, they are following their argument until some point you go deflationary, but other people could say, no, we should go uh, mm -hmm. metaphysically more, <laughs> I mean, hard commercial physics yeah. instead of, I mean, I, I want to hear your comments on something. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. Because I mean, at some point they are quite similar, but I mean, the, 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 the dynamic is quite similar, but after that, they, they draw different conclusions. Uh, but I think I will, I, have, I will have nothing against this, I think. Okay. Uh, just, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a kind of metaphysical project of yeah, yeah. trying to reduce stuff yeah. to other stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, if it works, if it's useful, I'm, uh, I'm all pragmatist. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> if it works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people, people like uh, Jonathan Schaffer, all these guys. Yeah. Okay, no, existence, of course, is, is all, everything exists yeah. in some sense. Like, mm -hmm. not the, the but then there's the question whether they think it's really mind dependent uh, or not. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a different topic. Okay, thanks. Perfect time. Thanks so much.